Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to Higher Chemistry. We're going to take a look today at Hess's Law calculations and also bond enthalpy calculations. Let's start with Hess's Law, since it's the first one on the list. It crops up in two places. crops up in multi-choice, one particular type of question, and uh, usually. And the written paper has like the other flavour of Hess's Law question. Let's start, what does Hess's Law say, first of all? Well, Hess's Law says that if you start with chemical A and you turn it into chemical D, for example, there will be a certain selection of bonds here, and they will have an enthalpy value stored in them, H1. These, your product, will have a different set of bonds, and it will have a different enthalpy, and that, of course, is why you have delta H, a change in enthalpy as you change from here to here. Nothing new there. But Hess said that you don't have to go straight from there to there. You could go around the houses, as it were. You could make chemical B. Then you could turn chemical B into chemical C. And then you could turn C into D. Uh, these will all have their own individual little delta H's, of course. But um, this plus this plus this must logically still be the same as this, because you're still going from these bonds to these bonds. It does make perfect sense, after all. Um, what's the significance of that in the real world? Well, we actually use, or used to use, Hess's Law. It's a sort of archaic hangover, to be honest, but the SQA love it, so we'll keep it in. It's only on, apparently, only on one page in the databook, uh, on the SQA document, sorry, but there's a lot hidden in there. Uh, I'll find the Scholar link and stick it in the doobly-doo in the video. Uh, I can't remember what it is just now. Let's have a look at a multiple-choice question. This, I think, is from 2018, recently, uh, if I remember correctly. This, I like this one because it's sort of the worst-case scenario. Um, often in these questions, they will tell you where you're starting and where you're ending up. Uh, they haven't, in this case. And often these questions will have real numbers in here as well. And they haven't. They've just got letters. So let's have a look at this uh, down below. According to Hess's law, if you look at this, all of these answers, hopefully you can see this on the screen, all of these answers are B equals something, some collection of the others. So there should be. So we must be starting with this and going to that, because that's the enthalpy change. And as I said, the round of houses version, so that's why it's B equals. Now, if you're paying attention last uh, two minutes, you would think, oh, well, Baldy said it's just this plus this plus this. But if you look closely, you will see that there is a directional arrow here. So that is indeed the delta H when you're going this way, which is the way we want to go. So that's fine. But now we want to go this way, which is against this arrow here. And this delta H, whatever number that is, is for going that way. We want to speculate what we do with C then. If it was a real number, say it was plus 20, it would become minus 20. So in this case, it just becomes negative C. And once again, we are now wanting to go there, which that one there will now become negative D. And we can add this and this and this. So it still has his law. It's this plus this plus this, which, of course, is a minus C minus D. Bit mathsy, I know. I'm sort of having cold shivers thinking of it. Wait till you get to the next part. Um, so that, of course, is the answer there. So this is the multiple choice favourite for Hess's Law. I call it the round the house's calculations. Um, as I said, sometimes it's real numbers, sometimes it's abstract like this. Let's have a look at the written question uh, for Hess's Law. Uh, it is here. Uh, 2019, I think, this one. This is an interesting one. See, 2019 has got uh, four marks worth just from this single one page. That's why I want to focus on the content that's in it. It's surprisingly tricky. Uh, so I call this the target equation. We are trying to work out the delta H for that. And what we're going to do is we're going to build up this equation from these little sub-equations. Once upon a time, these tended to be a lot tougher. They didn't give you the sub-equations. They expected you to look them up in the data book from the enthalpies of combustion, because if you look, these actually are defined as the enthalpy of combustion, which was the energy change when you burn one mole of a compound completely, and all the products and all the reactants are in the normal states at room temperature, which matches up exactly. That's why it's one to a half and not two to one. It wouldn't be the enthalpy of combustion. 
but I think they've st stopped calling them interludes of combustion and they even actually list them out like this, complete with the numbers you don't even need to look it up nowadays, which is grand. Still an easy two marks though if you know how to do it. Let's go hunting for things. I'm looking for um, three carbons, a solid, and they have to be on the left of the arrow. Now I'm seeing a carbon solid, excuse me, I'm looking for three carbons on the left of the arrow. I can find one carbon solid on the left of the arrow. Excellent. I, I'm hoping that you might suggest what we're going to do with this negative 394 then. We want three of them. So we simply multiply that by three. Um, I'm also looking for two hydrogens here. Uh, gaseous on the left of the arrow. And I see one hydrogen gaseous on the left. So that's grand. Multiply that by two. This is an interesting one. I'm looking for C3H4, whatever that is. Don't worry, it's problem solving, we don't care. And we're looking for it to be on the right of the arrow. Now there's our C3H4. Problem is, it's the wrong side of the arrow. What do you reckon we could do with this? We only need one of them, by the way. So what we're going to do is multiply that by negative 1, effectively. So that will flip the sign on that to positive 1939 instead of negative 1939. Now all you need is a calculator which is in my phone, which I'm currently using to film this. So, I'm going to pause the video, calculate the numbers, and I'll get back to you. So, there we go. There's three lots of negative 394, there's two lots of negative 286, and negative one of negative 1939, which becomes positive 1939. All you do is add them all together, and you get 185. As often happens in chemistry, the, the units are mentioned in the question, please write nothing at all in that case. Because if you accidentally write joules per mole, um, or just kilojoules without the mole, then you would lose one of these two precious marks, which would be such a shame. And that is you created, that, that you got two marks. If you're interested in why this works, let me show you why it works. Let's actually write out, see these three equations here? Let's actually physically do that. Multiply that by 3, multiply that by 2, and flip the last one. And then we'll stuff them all together as if they were simultaneous equations in maths. I'm sorry to swear at you using the word simultaneous equations. I'm going to pause the video while I do that. So, here's our three equations again, our three little sub-equations, only this time I've done the correct multiplying and rearranging. If you want to pause and have a look at what you would actually make, you'll suddenly see why all this multiplying and swapping and stuff actually works. You don't actually need to know why it works. As long as you can just do the numbers, just go hunting, like I said, you'll get the numbers and out pops the answer. But if you're interested in the reasoning behind it, and if they ever give you a deeper question to explain the meaning behind it, if you have a look over here, guys, you'll find three CO2s, and also three CO2s, opposite sides. If this was math, that was 3x and that's 3x, they're saying bye-bye. We're seeing two waters and two waters. So they've gone bye-bye as well. We're seeing four oxygens in total, and four oxygens. Which leaves us with exactly what we wanted. Three carbons plus two hydrogens makes C3H4. That's why all these delta H's combined is the same delta H as this bad boy here. It's quite elegant, it must be said. Just before we leave this behind, by the way, favourite one is to include an oxygen somewhere. And people flap about the oxygens because they find oxygens in multiple different places. My advice is to leave. If you find something in your target equation and it's in lots of different places, just leave it alone. It will probably cancel out in the end. That's not a great way of saying it, I know. But let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say, for example, there was an oxygen on this side. I know that there can be. Don't show it to me. Just say there was in your target equation. You would have found that instead of just being three oxygens, this probably would have been four oxygens. So you would have four oxygens here, plus another one is five oxygens on this side, four oxygens on this side. These all go, and one would be left behind on its lonesome. You know, so the oxygens come good in the end. I always leave them and hunt down everything else for this type of Hess's Law written question. Let's move on to bond enthalpies. Here is a bond enthalpy core. What is a bond enthalpy anyway in the first place? Good question. They are in the data book on page something that I've forgotten. Let me find them for you. The violent flapping of... There we go. Oh no, it's not it. There you go. I totally lost my bond enthalpy. Pause the video, hey, be professional. 
these are bond enthalpies. Basically, it's an indication of how strong a given covalent bond is. Uh, there's a whole table of them here, and there's another table of them here. Um, so the higher the number is, the stronger the bond is. Also, just as an aside, you notice these ones are just called bond enthalpies. These ones are called mean bond enthalpies. That doesn't mean they won't give you a biscuit. That means these are average numbers here, and these are precise numbers. I wonder why. Well, if you look at all these molecules here, I'm hoping you can maybe speculate. If you look at all these molecules, you'll find you can't add anything on to the end. All the valences are all used up completely. So that is the end of the molecule. It can't go any further. These ones, on the other hand, these ones can go further out. Um, so where was I? Sorry. Yes, these are absolute numbers. These are means because you can have other things attached. And if you were to attach another carbon to this, compared to, say, another hydrogen or a, some weird, like a fluorine, it would change the strength of this bond. And that's why this number here is just an average of all the possible variations you can get on a carbon-carbon bond. Which are quite a few, as you can imagine. Um, a favourite question uh, for the SQA is they get you to work out an enthalpy change using these numbers, and then they describe an experiment with enthalpy changes actually measured, and they ask you to explain why the two are not really this identical, and that is the key. Because these are averages, so therefore they will not be correct, whereas the actual stuff you react... That's obviously correct. Let's go on to have a look at a question. How do we do them? Well, this is the top question here. Uh, the simplest member of a family is ethane. Never heard of it. That's okay. It's problem solving. Don't let that put you off. Oh, triple bond. Very cool. Uh, and it's made from ethane, uh, forming ethane and a couple of hydrogen molecules. They have been really nice to you in this question. If it was me, I am a bad man. So I would actually have written it as this. C2H5. I would write written the formula version makes. I might write that out because that's new but I would say plus 2H2 two, and you'll see why that's a bit devious in the very near future. Right, politicians love slogans that are made up of three words so we should come up with two slogans here to help you remember this. Let's start with this one. Breaking bonds is endothermic. In other words, to break bonds, you need to supply energy to the bond. Sort of makes sense. Slightly weird, but the opposite also applies. So making bonds, any new bonds you make, is exothermic process. So the delta H for this will be positive, and the delta H for this will be negative. And what you're going to do is like Lego, literally like Lego. Imagine that was a Lego molecule. You're going to pull it all apart, or like the Molly Mods, in fact. You pull it all apart, and then you're going to build this and these two. So let's look at the bonds we are going to break, which in today is in purple. We're going to break one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bonds. We're going to break. That's six CH bonds and one CC bond. So let's keep it in purple. So we're going to break six CHs and one CC. Uh, the bonds we're going to make, on the other hand, now you see, by the way, now you see why it would be nasty if they're giving the formula. Is if they do give the formula, please draw it out. Take 30 seconds to draw it out, then you're more likely to see all the bonds. What we're going to make, on the other hand, well, we're going to make one of them. So you make one triple bond. You're going to make two CH bonds. And you're going to make two HH bonds. I'm just about to go and look at these numbers up and put some numbers in for you. You don't want to see me doing that, so I will pause this. As if by magic, the numbers have all appeared. Um, six CH bonds, six lots of 412. Add up this, it comes to positive. Remember, breaking bonds is endothermic, and endothermic is positive. If you can't remember delta H's, I'll try and put a link somewhere up here to my video on delta H from a long time ago. Um, so that's positive 2820. And making is exothermic, so these are all negative, so that's negative 2, 5, 3, 4. All you do is add them together, and you get a grand total of, uh, it will actually be positive, won't it? Yes, it will be, so let's keep the colour code running. It will be 286. 
and actually got two marks. No kilojoules per mole or anything like that. Remember, it's in the question. I know I can hear the physics people grinding their teeth over this, and they're sort of right. Chemistry is really chickened out in terms of units, but that's okay. Let's just go with it. Get you the marks. Um, and I think that's it, guys. So, very quick recap on what was going on today. Um, Hess's law is about the fact that if you go from one chemical to another, the delta H overall is always the same, no matter how many sub-steps you take. And they can show this or test you this in a couple of ways. They can give you this little diagrammatic version, or they can give you a target equation that you're trying to assemble from little sub-equations by cancelling stuff out. Go hunting for what you need, flipping it as you need to. If you flip it, you change the sign, plus or mi sorry, plus or minus, you change it the other way around. If you need a multiplier, then don't forget to put your multiplier in for the delta H's. We then looked at bond enthalpies. They're just strengths of bonds. They are indications of strengths of bonds. They're in uh, the data book. And there's a difference between the pure accurate ones and the mean average ones. Uh, and in order to uh, break, uh, sorry, in order to do a reaction and calculate the delta H for that reaction, you can dismantle all these bonds. Don't forget if there was a multiplier here, if you had like two of these, then the whole number here would be twice as big. Um, it's a good idea to write it out so you can see exactly what bonds are being broken. Watch for things like water. See if you just write 2H2O, you're thinking, oh yeah, that's an HO bond. Yeah, you're forgetting that water looks like that. So one water actually contains two OH bonds. So in two waters, you're actually breaking, or making, of course, whichever way around, you're making four OH bonds. We need to remember that breaking bonds is endothermic. If you were normally in the class with me, in fact, those of us who were in the class well, I've seen I do a stupid sleight of hand magic trick where it looks like I steal something out of somebody's pencil case, usually a pencil, and I have to put effort in to break the pencil. It's not their pencil, of course. I have substituted it. I look in advance. This is how magic tricks are done. They're really tedious when you know how they're done. I wander around the room chatting to people. I look at the type of pencil they've got. Uh, I've already looked in the stationery cupboard, see if we have a spare one like that. I then put it up my sleeve, I ask to borrow their pencil, turn my back, swap it around, and apparently break their pencil. I'm very immature like that. But what it does is, once I give them their pencil back and everybody realises what it is, it tends to fix it in their mind that I had to strain to break the pencil. So breaking bonds is endothermic. You have to put the energy in, and that's an endothermic process. Making bonds, when they reform, boop, the energy pops back out again. So these are all negatives, these are positives. Put them together. There's your answer. There's your two marks. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye.